For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Bibles to 1 Timothy. We're looking at verse, we're in the second chapter, of course, and we're looking at verses 11 through 13. You recall we broke chapter 2 into two sections of, of study. We're in that second section that we broke into four parts for study that's on your paper. The top of your paper shows, and today we're in verses 11 through 13. The order of creation, uh, uh, the order of divine authority uh, in this passage is connected to creation. The order of divine authority. um, It's important that we understand what Paul is trying to say for us. Because we tend in the church, let me tell you why this is important. We tend to, over every generation has this problem, and that's trying to interpret the Word of God into cultural changes. We think that the Word of God should fit our culture. Uh, And so we always want to interpret the scriptures according to culture. <clears throat> you can't do that. And Paul is going to talk about the order of a divine authority, and he's going to say that it has been in existence by the word of God <clears throat> since creation. So let's take a look at this. In verse 11 through 13, Paul says, Let a woman quietly receive instructions with entire submission, that's submission, submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach nor to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And here's what he says. For it was Adam who was first created, then Adam. And so he gives an order here. <clears throat> he shows the order of creation, but what he's talking about is the order of divine authority. And he says the order of divine authority goes all the way back to creation. Not only does culture not change the word of God, <clears throat> different civilizations don't. For example, We live in the post-Diluvian civilization. We live in the period of after the flood of Noah. Prior to that, that would be uh, the antediluvian world of Genesis 1 through uh, 10 or 9. The flood is over. And then we have this uh, post-Diluvian situation arise. You and I live, our, our historical origin is the post-Diluvian period. And in that post-Diluvian period, God did some unique things. He developed the concept of dispensations. They are very clear after, they're very clear in our dispensation, Uh, In our civilization, the Jewish age, the church age, and then the coming of the millennial age. And the only thing that changed within the structure of the post-Diluvian period that's of great importance to you and I is that we go from the law that that Noah carried over, uh, the word of God that he carried over on the ark, that got developed into the Mosaic law of great shadow Christology. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. You can tell I'm battling the same thing that most of you people are battling right now. Uh, (coughs) Wasn't 
it wasn't, I didn't know it was that obvious, but thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so let me get right to, <coughs> I covered this with you. Let me get right to the point, point number one. I want to begin uh, looking at verses 11, 12, and 13. Once again, when you're studying Paul, you got to put your thinking cap on. He's not necessarily easy. Uh, you have to pay a lot of structure. He is, once you understand how he writes and how he structures things in the Greek language. But I want to break this down into three parts, verse 11, 12, and 13. Uh, and I put them in a homiletical point for us to look at. The predication of the order of divine authority. Listen to me. I can't tell you how important this is. The word submission. The, pre the predication of the, the, the predication of the, of the order that there is a divine order of authority is in the word submission. It is in the, it is in the word submission. The affirmation what I'm saying is the affirmation that there is an order of divine authority is in the word submission. It, it could be in the word obey. It could be found in the construction of an imperative mood. And that's important. That we, and he says this in verse 11, let a woman receive... Instruction. He's talking about Christian women. And you remember, we're talking about the spiritual role of Christian women in the church. Let a woman receive instructions. <clears throat> this, and I'm going to come back to that, but I just want to make the point that this word submission is a dynamic idea of where he's going with this. The second thing is a proposition in verse 12. And the proposition comes from the command. Now, what you don't see in the English is that in verse 11, there's a command. Monthano, the word for disciple or the word for, for instructions, that this is a verbal form of the word for disciple, a learner. Now, in the verbal form, this is the learning. This is the learning for a disciple. Let a woman receive instructions now what you what you can't see here is that the word instructions is an imperative it's a present active imperative it's a third person singular of montano now what's interesting is the third person singular the command stands i mean we all understand the imperative mood is a, a command or a commandment. It's a command. But what's interesting to me in this passage is that it's third person singular. He is speaking to every Christian woman. Now, he could have lumped them all together. We, we, you know, we do have a third person plural. And it puts them all in that category. <clears throat> but that's not what he does. And... The writer, what he's actually saying is that each woman has got to come within her own decision of whether she's going to do this or not. But listen, it should not be a hard decision for the woman. That would be every female setting in my class. We consider you a woman. <clears throat> This should not be a hard decision for you because you understand the importance of a divine command. A divine command focuses on the divine will of God. When, when, when God gives you an imperative mood, a command, it is for you to understand the dynamics of the importance of that to your life. And if he's speaking to a woman in the church at this time, and I am to every woman in this church at this time, that we're speaking to you personally. I mean, it is, each woman has got to understand the importance of this. And so I find that to be interesting in the way Paul laid that thing out. 
uh, the proposition in verse 12 that he comes off the command with, the proposition from the command in verse 12, uh, in verse 11, is two negatives and a positive. Two negatives and a positive. He says, I do not allow a woman to teach, nor. You see, that's a not that's carried over. So we have two negatives. I do not allow a woman to teach, nor to exercise authority over a man in the congregation. We're talking about assembly congregation. But to remain quiet. What does the quiet, where does the idea of quiet come from? Listen to me now, this is important. It comes from submission. Submission to divine authority. I didn't write this. Now, I'm just telling you what it says. And listen, it doesn't change culturally. The culture doesn't dictate the Word of God. The Word of God dictates the culture. I don't care what the rest of the women of the world are doing. I don't care what the rest of the woman in all the gunky churches are doing. But for the church that I passed over, this is important. This has not changed because we live in America and live under a constitution. Now, do you not, listen, do you not think that God is smart enough to know this in advance? If he wants to give you wiggle, worm, uh, wiggle worms, <laughs> if he wants to give you wiggle room, he gives you room, all right? By the way, I'm not that hungry <laughs> at this point. <clears throat> now, what is interesting is the word exercise authority. Notice I wrote it on your paper. Authenticity is where, where this English word is, authenticity authenticity and that is being able to grasp the the importance of this principle in the life of spiritually advancing women in the church authenticity i do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man to remain quiet the third thing is president what is interesting now he's building a case he has built it off from a command into a proposition. Off that command, he's built it into a proposition and a precedent of the order of divine order. And he takes it all the way back to Adam and Eve. Takes it all the way back to... Did he take it all the way back to Adam and Eve? And now he did it take it back to Adam and Eve, but he took it back to an order. How do I know? Because he said first Adam, then Eve. And in the Greek, it means first, and then second, and then third, and then fourth, whatever. <clears throat> so he has connected this whole idea of the order of divine authority. He has connected it to the creation of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> now, there's something also interesting in here. The word create is not the typical word for create in the English. This word create in English, that's not what the Greek says. It's not, that's not what it says at all. If you happen to have your Greek text with you today, and you look into your Greek text, you will see that it's talking about form or shape. Plasso is the word that's used in the Greek language here. Plasso, P-L-A-S-S, -S oh, I wrote it, I think. Yeah, I wrote it. P-A-L-A-P-L-A-S-S-O, Plasso. Listen, in the English, that's where we get the word plastic. And it's referring to a mold, a mold like a plastic. And he talks about it for Adam and for Eve. Now, in Genesis, the second chapter, verse 7, he uses the word Zatzar, Zatzar for forming man, Adam, out of the ground, right? We all know he was made out of, you girls know man is made out, is dirt. 
Let me, see, let me go ahead and just get that out of the way so we can get on. Dirt or the ground. Yatsar is the word that's used for Adam. God took the earth and formed. And it became a mold for man. Then he does something interesting in the Hebrew. In the second chapter of Genesis, verse 22, we get to the woman. It's not good for man to be alone. Where God's going to create him a woman. Uh, a woman that's been designed for his life. It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to give him a help me. And so here's what he does. He banas. He B-A-N-A-H. He banas the woman. He builds her. He constructs her. He takes a living rib. out of Adam and forms Eve. Bana. See, we men know about women's built. God built the woman. He formed the man. He fashioned the man. But he built the woman. Paul, what he does is he takes the word plasso, And uses it for the creation of first Adam and then Eve. But when you go back to the original text, you see that there was much more that went on that. What's the point? Paul is not making a big deal out of the creation, right? He just used one word. He just threw it out there and went, you know, uh, the potter and uh, the pot, you know, the potter and that's all he's talking about. The emphasis for Paul is not on the creation, but the order of the divine authority that came from it. And he used a very blah term, plasso, just to talk about the creational aspect. But for his emphasis is on the order of divine authority in our life. Because he's talking to the, he's talking to the women of the church under the new covenant. So that gives you kind of an idea of where Paul is going. I mean, where is Paul getting his information? Where is he working from? Well, he's working from his Bible, the Old Testament. <clears throat> and more than likely, out of the Septuagint. Now, for me, what our sovereign God is teaching in his word what he's teaching is relevant to every Christian woman of every ethnic culture, of every nation, of every, of every century of the church age. This is not going to change because you live in China. This is not going to change because you live in Hawaii. This is not going to change because... You live in South America or any of the continents or whatever. It's not going to change. This word of God is the same. The culture doesn't change it. America does not change the word of God. Russia does not change the word of God. It has nothing to do with your ethnic, your language, your nationality, or anything else. Now, what's interesting to our civilization, the post diluvian civilization, is that before the flood, they were of one language. And in our post-Diluvian period, he changed the whole shooting match. You can read about it in Genesis, the 11th chapter. I wrote down verse 7. He said, come, let us, talking to the Godhead, come, let us go down and there confuse their languages so that they will not understand one another's speech. And he set the perimeter for the post-Diluvian period. Descendants, language, and national boundaries. Now listen to me. There is still one common language. It is the Word of God. 
It don't matter what nation, it doesn't matter what language, and it doesn't matter what ethnic group. It has nothing to do with that. Here is the one language that's still there. Tell me you understand that. And this does not change because it moves to a nation or a different culture or a different language. It does not change. This is the one common language for mankind. The Word of God. Therefore, when you transliterate this language of the Word of God into the national language, you must be sure that you stay true to the Word of God. And when you do, it doesn't matter what language the Word of God is translated into, the message is the same. One of the amazing things for those who travel internationally and meet other Christians of different ethnic and languages and boundaries is the commonality, the commonality that we have with one another through the Word of God. That's amazing, right? If you've traveled any, you know it. I found that when I traveled from the north to the south. I didn't have to go overseas. So for me, passages like this are very important to subjects like this. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Listen, it'll pass away when God says so, not, not, not when somebody else says so. But heaven and earth will pass away because God says so. But he says, my word, listen to that, my word shall not pass away. My word, it's universal. It's always been universal. We live in the post-Diluvian period. It doesn't matter what language. It doesn't matter what boundary. It doesn't matter what ethnic. It doesn't matter. The word of God. Listen, the devil knows that. The, the word of God is the most powerful book in the library of, of the world. It changes men's hearts as nothing else can do. And the devil knows it, and so he fights it tooth and nail. This is our, our month. February is our month to, to support our foreign missionaries. Be sure you pick up one of these little cards. I still have Judy Archer's name on one of them. Of course, her name is now the Williams, but I didn't have cards redone for this year. But, you know, Judy is still our missionary. She just got to go to a different place. She's still our missionary. <clears throat> like Jesus Christ, God's word is the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. The second point that I want to make, so don't get crazy with me, okay? Do not get crazy with me and say, yes, but Paul didn't take in consideration uh, uh, the culture, I don't know what Paul took in consideration. I have no idea. But I know what God did. I study Paul, Paul's teaching of the Word of God. <clears throat> I'm after the Word of God. Now, the second thing is Paul used the Greek word where we get the word authenticity in the English, authoneo. Authoneo means to establish the authenticity of the order of divine authority. That's why Paul says, after giving a command in verse 11, he says, I do not allow. Now, remember, there's a command. The word instructions is a very strong idea. He says, in verse 12, he says, I do not allow. He puts a strong negative ook with epitreco. He puts it a present active indicative, first person singular. I do not allow, and we're talking about an apostle, okay, as far as authority. I do not allow women to teach nor to exercise authority over man. All right? And he makes a very strong case for this out of the command that's given in verse 11, uh, translated, receive instructions. The order of divine authority was established with creation prior to the fall of man is what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 2.13. In other words, when God created, listen, when God created Adam and Eve, he had already established a divine authority uh, order, 
a, a divine order of authority. That's what he says in verse 13. And, 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 and that's important. Therefore, listen, on the next page, or flip it over, whatever you do. <clears throat> Since that's true, and Paul says that with the creation of Adam and Eve, the divine authority, uh, or order of divine authority that was already established came into play. You do see that he says the order came into play with the creation of Adam and Eve. <coughs> see, we can, play, we can play chess now because we have a king and a queen out here. Whatever. <coughs> now, that means, now listen to me, that means that actually the div order of divine authority was established at the Eternal Life Conference and has become associated with Christ before creation. You see, the big, the, the big satanic warfare that rages today raged before the foundation of the world, before the creation, and that was that God said, said that the centerpiece of my entire program is going to be Christ, is going to be my son. And this led to a revolt in eternity past. And this whole order, divine order of authority, is based on Christ. When Adam and Eve came along, then this order is now operational, this order of divine authority. For example, I'm going to read to you from John 17, 5. It's on your paper, but just in the verse. And he says again that he's going to say basically the same thing in verse 24. And now, Father, this is one of his great prayers. You know, John 17 in the upper room is one of his great prayers. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence. Now watch what he says. Pay attention to what he says. Now, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you, listen, before the world began. That's how this, that's how the, the, the angelic revolt, this is what the angelic revolt was all about, and that's why the revolt's still going on. <laughs> Satan was able to lead a third of the angels over this revolt, and now he's trying to get at least a third of mankind. Let me tell you, let me tell you the absolute truth. He works a lot harder than we do. We must not let him win anything in our generation. We give him nothing. See, this angelic warfare is over men's souls. That's what it was about in eternity past. I gave you other passages on this eternal life conference. I often hear people say, where in the world do you ever get the idea of an eternal life conference? Well, we get it from the idea, and I wrote several passages down where there is discussion about before the creation of the world. That's where we get it in theology. In Matthew, the 13th chapter 35, Jesus said, and people miss this. I hope we don't. He said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things. Now watch this. Hidden since the creation of the world. <coughs> when he came to earth in his incarnation, he began to teach things that were unknown apart from the eternal life conference in eternity past. And he taught them in parables. So those who had positive volition could get it, and those who had negative volition didn't have a clue. We, 
we're often asked in the school of biblical theology, why did Jesus teach in parables? And there's the answer. There's the answer. And what Paul did, or what Jesus did, was he quoted from his Bible, Psalm 78, 2. If you have a study Bible, you will see that that's a reference to Psalm 78, 2, right? Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. If you have a study Bible, they're going to refer you back to Psalms which, where, where it's, prof it's prophesied that this is... This was, Psalm 78 is a Messianic Psalms, and it's to identify who the Messiah. And listen, he taught in parables all the time. It was to be a Messianic sign. I'm emphasizing the part that this was true before creation. That's my argument. See, that's my argument. The standard for the order of the chain of command in the divine authority structure is recorded in 1 Corinthians 11.3, and so I want you to turn with me there. Be sure we have that. 11.3. <coughs> Paul lays this out. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every woman, and the man is head of every woman, uh, man, the man is, he, Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. See the word head? That's an authority. That's a figure of authority. Listen, they say, well, who's the head of your business? Who's the head of your company? Who is the head of your um, restaurant? Who is the, right? I mean, when we want God a problem, we want, I, I want the head guy to give me some resolution to this. And we're not going to be happy unless we get that from some lower person until we go all the way to the top. If that's, if that's that important, we want, eventually we're going to keep going up. So somebody gives me an answer I, I'm happy with. <laughs> the head man. And so, the, so look, here's how he does it. Looking backwards, he goes, God, Christ, and then divine delegated authority, and then whoever's under that. See, God, Christ, God, Christ, divine delegated authority. It could be a husband to a wife. It could be parents to children. It could be business, the chain of command from the head down. In other words, uh, the bosses and then to the employees, and, and the administrative things. Okay? That's the order. When we say, well, what is the divine order, Ron? How does it go? Well, so you got God, you got Christ, then you got the church. Now, this makes it unique because church is not a divine institution. It's an it's a, it's a institution by itself. It's unique in itself. There's nothing like it. Nothing. You can't compare it to anything. When the church tries to compare itself to a business and operate by business models, it destroys itself. A church is unique in itself. In the church, you have a unique structure. In the church, you have a unique structure because the Lord is the head of the church, and then the pastor and deacons are an authority structure. Then you have the congregation. And so we're in, we're not in a divine institutional structure. We're in a, we're in a church structure, a unique structure. And that's what Paul is talking about. You can't. There's no other, you can't compare this to anything else. And the nearest thing that Paul could get to it was in Ephesians 5 when he compared marriage to the church. The marriage between a, hus a Christian husband and a Christian wife is compared to Christ and the church that he died to redeem. But if you're not saved, that comparison doesn't work. That's a divine institution that's not comparable. Can't take two unbelievers and compare them to Christ and the church. Can't do that at all. <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of a unique. Third thing, oh, I didn't write this. 
if you're interested, I would take this. And if you're not interested, you need to ask yourself at halftime why that wasn't interesting. <laughs> there is, listen to me, there is equality in salvation. There is equality in salvation. <clears throat> Men, women, uh, slave, free, male, female. We know Galatians, third chapter, 26 through 28. First Corinthians 12, 13. We know these passages. There is equality in salvation. There is equality in salvation, but not in the divine chain of command. That's why it's called the chain of command. <clears throat> There's no equality there. Look, when I got drafted and went to the Army, we were all soldiers. We were all soldiers. Everybody was a soldier. We were a soldier first and a rank second. And the way I knew that is my uncles who had served in the Second World War and come home alive told me that, that on the battlefield, we're all soldiers on the battlefield. We're all soldiers first. Yet within that structure, to make sure that that runs smooth, there's a structural order of rank and authority. Yet we're all soldiers. It's not true. It's not true we're all equal in our rank and authority. Didn't take me long to learn that. You don't, you don't get out of basic and beyond unless you buy into that idea. And so the writer, there is equality in salvation, but not in the chain of command, and we see it in Galatians and other passages. In First, in first Peter, third chapter, verses 1 through 6, we see it with Sarah and Abraham. In verse 6, it says that Sarah called Abraham Lord. That's a little L, by the way. But you know why it's an, a little L? Is because the big L is over him. The Lord is over Abraham. She recognizes the, the chain of command that it's Abraham as a little L of authority and it's Jesus with the big L. And listen, there were many times in Sarah's life when she had to go to the big L because the little L wasn't doing his, his deal. Come on. And that's what First Peter, the first, third chapter 1 through 6 is all about. That's exactly what it's about. Now, in point number three, <clears throat> Paul used the Greek word hesokia. He, sokia. He, sokia is the word for quiet. It's also the word for silent. And this work, word is a wonderfully unique because it means inner and outer. To be quiet inner and to be quiet outer. To be silent inner and to be silent out. I keep telling you all the time, and, and on the very bottom of this page, there's an exercise for you, uh, homework, home study. <clears throat> but this inner dialogue, if you're going to have inner dialogue, be sure it's with the Lord and not with yourself. Because that's the privilege you have to come to the throne of grace. You have that privilege in Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. You have that privilege. Not to take advantage of that privilege. Not very smart. <clears throat> but you see, in order to have good inner dialogue... You got to have it with another person that's smarter than you are, at least. Somebody who has been tempted like you and has won over it. That's the Lord. 
But to enter that relationship with him, you've got to become silent with the relationship within yourself. That inner dialogue with yourself about what's going on in your life, you've got to go to silence to be able to hear the Lord. Now, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound easy? Until, like my daughter says, your pants get in a wad. <laughs> and it shuts off all, all the blood to your head. And you just get crazy. <clears throat> then it takes you a day or two to walk your way back out of it. Because you've walked yourself into a mess. You've become your worst enemy. This word silent is very important, but it's not going to work unless you understand submission to the divine authority. Silence will never come without submission. And this word that Paul used is really unique because it tells you to be silent inside. There are times when you need to be at peace. You need to be quiet and silent inside. And there are times when you need to be silent and quiet on the outside because when you're talking, you can't hear. And when you can't hear, you can't learn. Am I talking to anybody today? That gives a hoot. This should really matter to you because this is your life. This is how you live. And you can get yourself all riled up without anybody doing it for you. You can do it all on your own. <coughs> By the time the fight comes... You're a raving maniac. Right? I, this person walks through the door, I'll just punch him. I don't care who it is. In walks mother, and you go like, well, I better not do that. It's very important. It's very important. This word is never going to work in your life without submission. And it's about submission to the divine authority structure that God has in your life. And you have all the great tools by grace. You're equipped with the indwelling Holy Spirit. You have the word of God. The Holy Spirit will bring the word of God. He will. Listen, I love this. If you will get silent and submit, the Holy Spirit will teach and recall the things he's taught you that's pertinent to what's going on. I mean, you get so, you get so riled up, you can't even... I mean, you don't even know where your Bible is and could care less right now. I'm at war. Do I sound like I'm talking personally here? Well, I am. This is so easy to teach and so hard to live. This is so easy to teach. I'm going to close, and I'm going to tell you a little something. I don't know anybody else's life but my own, so I just talk about my own. Jane was able to come to church with me last Sunday, which was a thrill. Women have to carry a purse... and things in it that make no sense other than they don't carry a gun. <laughs> now, for me, if you're going to carry a very big purse, you might as well just pack. Because the rest of it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense as far as combat. <clears throat> well, Monday I didn't think about Jane's purse. And Tuesday night I thought about it because we had a, den a, a doctor's appointment on Wednesday and she needs all that stuff in her purse. You know, all the medical things and 
all of our medicines and all, you know, all that stuff. Being the carekeeper, or whatever I'm called, husband, I start looking for all that stuff, right? It's not going to be hard to find because Jane keeps everything in that little old black purse. Well, I couldn't find that little black purse. So what I did is what I've been taught all my life to do, and here's an example of old man thinking. It's not wrong. I'm just telling you, here's an old man system. This is a system I've been taught all my life, and it's, it's worked for me or I wouldn't keep it. Backtrack, right? Where, where's the last time you remember having it? And then back, backtrack, and so I did. I looked all over the house, looked all over my car, came down to the church, went through the church, no purse. Now I start to panic. Credit cards, yada, 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 yada. Now I begin to get, I'm into inner dialogue. Jane would say something, I couldn't even hear her. I'm on the phone with Ron Adema. <laughs> the more I process that, the worse off I got. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting clammy and everything. I finally go to bed that night. Not easy, but finally go to bed. I get up the next morning, I'm in the same state of mind I was when I went to bed. Because now I'm on a time schedule. I don't, now I've got to be someplace at 1030 with all that information, and all that God knows who's got my purse, and, and I've, I could have wrote a book. I could have wrote a book on what my mind and I were talking about. I could have wrote a book. Well, I know what they did. Then I got to thinking, how high is my limit? Then I think, how, how am I ever going to find all that information? So... Listen, now I'm at Wednesday. Jane says to me, have we prayed about this? Oh. I mean, no. <laughs> no. When that came out of my mouth, I was just like, I've been in this. I've worked myself up. And she said, have we, have we prayed about this? And, you know, my no didn't come out, no. You know, my no, no came out of my mouth like, no. Because <laughs> I was all revved up under old man thinking system, our old man system. And I was absolutely shocked that I could be two days into this thing and never stop to pray. I was two days into this thing. So we stopped and prayed. I went, oh, dear God. You have a bozo for sure. I, what is wrong with me that I wouldn't go to the divine system, Father? What is wrong with me? Why would I go two days scratching the walls trying to figure out something that only you could tell me? So I took her back, got her dressed, got her ready to go see the doctor. I went back out. Now, I've looked under the couches. I've moved. You know, when you get panicky, you move everything. I mean, I did everything but paint the house. If somebody would have suggested, I'd probably done it. <laughs> and I walked back into Ben. 
I said, wait a minute. I walked back in the den. I lifted up a pillow. I had looked on the other side and not looked on this side because we never put it there. I lift the pillow up, and there it was. I think God does that sometimes. <laughs> or allows it to remind me. You can know the truth. But it won't set you free unless you exercise it. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But you have to exercise it. That was a great reminder to me. Oh, just a great reminder. So, see, you can study the Bible a great deal and know the languages and do all this stuff. But you see, listen to me. It took me two days to become silent, to listen to God. It took me two days. Hunting. Hunting. Don't do that. Can I tell you not to do that? That's just old man thinking. There was nothing wrong with the process. Listen, I, but I should have done, the priority should have been to go to the Lord in prayer, seek his counsel, seek his wisdom. Stop talking to yourself. You're a dummy. I know better than anybody how stupid I can be. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is this idea, <clears throat> silence will work when you become submissive. It won't unless you do. Submit and become silent. And let him show you. And listen, the great, and it's on your paper, the great exercise that comes out of this is to sit down with the Lord and do the review so that you don't fall in that same pattern of bold behavior next time you go to a different system. You go to the divine system right away. And it keeps all that inner turmoil from just <laughs> getting you blind-eyed. Let us pray. We'll have this word of prayer. The men will take the offering, and then we'll be dismissed for 15 minutes. <laughs> There's coffee and donuts or whatever downstairs. I know, Father, that this is... Uh, this Christian life and Christian growth is, is quite a journey. <laughs> and uh, we just have to be reminded to spiritually stay on top of our game. And when we get into inner dialogue with ourselves, we need to stop and be submissive, become quiet, and listen to the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God that He will speak to our hearts. He will teach and recall. He will produce within us a calmness. Everything is okay. And then the process, the hunt. But not without it because you need to be calm. Allow the Spirit of God to show you why this is going on in your life. The advantage that it is for you. I pray today, Father, as we take our offering that we, we have given as been purposed in our heart. We're not under some kind of legal system. We're under a grace system. <coughs> we pray we would be good stewards of this. Give as much as possible, Father, to the gospel of Christ around the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
the way Paul sets things up is very interesting. Sometimes we just read through it and we don't pay any attention to how he sets things up. And how he sets them up is, uh, is very important to get what he's after. And what he does, he mentions 15 things in verses 4 through 8, he, he, or 4 through 7. <coughs> he mentions 15 things. He does a positive and negative. He shows you seven things that are positive and eight things that are negative about love. Uh, and that's kind of unique. Uh, he says, here's what love is and here's what love isn't. You know, and you say, well, I wonder why you would do that. Well, there's a lot of people that say, I love you, and then do all the things that love is not about. And so he wants to be sure the church understands what love is and what love isn't. And even if a person says, I love you, and do all these things that are uh, evidence of love, either they don't understand what love is, certainly from a category of the Word of God. So here's what he does that's interesting about it, though. And rather than just list seven things that are positive and eight things that are negative, he does something interesting. He starts with a positive in verse 4. He says, he says love, is and love is patient and love is kind. Then he stops. And then he goes and talks about what love isn't. <coughs> and he lists eight things. He says, and he's not going to come back to the subject of love until he gets through. He says, love is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. You see, and it's, it, listen, this is in relationship. In other words, he's talking about these are the things in relationships. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. And then he comes back to the positives. He... He broke this list of positives with a whole string of negatives. Listen to what Paul's going to do. Paul is going to say in chapter 13, he's going to say, I want to step aside a moment and talk about love. Who doesn't love us? I mean, it was by far uh, my lessons on love is by far hit a lot. People are starved to death for information on love. That's why you have all these internet uh, deals, you know, matchmakers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can teach a series on love, and it, 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 it's a big deal. So what Paul does, he said, I want to talk about love, and he starts right out that way about love. Then he gets into personal relationships, into personal relationships. And he says, love is patient, love is kind. And then Paul stops. He gives this whole string of what love isn't. Love is not, love is not, love is not, love is not, love is not. It's very difficult when you're in a relationship for the person that you're in a relationship with to tell you these things because it becomes very defensive. It's very difficult for somebody that you are engaged in a relationship for that person to say to you, you're jealous, you're, you're, you, you're a braggart, you're arrogant, you're unbecoming, you're, you seek your own... You're, you provoke, you, you always hold a grudge, you, you're always accounting for the wrong, you always keep score on what's, what I'm not doing right, but you never, you never promote what is right. Uh, and he goes through this whole list. It does not rejoice. 
uh, he does all that, and then he comes back to the subject. He comes back to the subject. That's just unbelievable. Who would ever do that unless you're doing it to make a big point? And that's how Paul does it. Paul is about, he made a big point. There are Christian people in the church in relationships with each other that love the topic of love, but when it came to the exercise of it in the personal relationship, the two people were light years apart on what they believed about it. And so he says, love is patient, love is kind. Then he stops and go through a whole list of what love isn't. Then he comes back in verse 6, he says, at, this, at the last part of verse 6, he comes back, but love rejoices with the truth. Love bear, bears all things. Love believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Then he says, you see, love never fails. Now, if I was having a, if I was having a, a meeting with you, if I was in a small group dynamic course, I would have had you, the two columns, what love is and what isn't, and we'd have wrote a whole list of them down. And then we'd have went back and I would have had you circle the ones that are in your relationship that, that are there in your relationship that is damaging your relationship and you would circle them. And what you would have, you'd have a little bit on each side. You would have some over here. There would be some circled over here. And then you would have some circled over here. Then Paul would tell you, here's what Paul would say. This is what Paul did. Paul would say, now I want you to step back a moment. And I want you to write which side is love never fails. On what side of this list, here is what love isn't, here's what love is. On which side of these two ledgers do you think love will fail? Because Paul says that love never fails. When you do, when you do marital counseling, this is what I do. I start with the word of God. I lay it up there. And I said, where, where, look, here, here are 15 things about love. Circle the, circle the sides. Circle. Let's list them. And then circle the ones. And let's talk about it. Because Paul says love never fails. So what is the end when you've got, when you, over here on these eight, half of them are circled. And over here you got one or two circled. You see that's not the balance you want. But here's the encouraging thing. Not Listen, all that can be changed if you understand that love never fails. Because if, you, if I said to you, like I did, which side would you put love never fails, you would have put it on the positive side, right? Because this is what love is. This is what love isn't. So this isn't love. This is love. But you know what he said? He said love never fails. You see, God's love is so great it covers both sides, but you have to make a decision about it. You have to come to God's understanding of what love is and what isn't. And if you think this side is love, it isn't. It is not. But here's the point. God's love never fails. It never fails. Listen, I've had people who this one side was all marked up and the other side hadn't anything. And when I would say, well, what, put me, put well, love never fails, tell me what side that would work. Well, they put it on the positive side. I said, that's not where God put it. He put it at the bottom of, of the discussion, right? He said, here's what you've got to know today. Love, never, God's love never fails, but you've got to be active with it. It never fails. But listen, it's going to fail in your relationship in the sense because you're not doing the things, you're not approaching your marriage with love. And so if you want this, listen to me, 
love never fails. If you want your marriage to be over on this side of the page, the positive side of love, rather than the negative side, then you've got to choose to live over here rather than live over here. Agreed? You've got to make this change. It's got to be a conscious change. I'm no longer going to be that person. Then the question is, how can you do that? You can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit will take care of that side. It's supernatural. You don't have to do it in the flesh. You can do it in the Spirit. And then he says, at the end of the whole chapter, he says, listen, there are three, three things that are very important in your life, faith, hope, and love. But I'm telling you, the bottom line, the most important, the greatest is love. So, happy Valentine's. If there is one group of people in the whole wide world, it's the people who have been born again by the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, who understand how much God loves us, to be the epitome of that love to those that God has given us for lifetime partnerships our wife and our husband and our children and our grandchildren, our children. That's what Valentine's is about. If it's about anything. <coughs> now if you'll, we were in 13, if you go back to verse 11, we'll do the Eucharist. <coughs> If you have a bulletin, inside that bulletin is an important piece of paper for you to do the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. Some, there are many names for this. They're all right. We use it because of the word. The Greek word Eucharist means giving thanks. Verse 23, 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, that's the word Eucharistia, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That in remembrance of me is what we understand about the body of Christ that went to the cross in my place as a substitute for my sins. The crucifixion. And the word remembrance is what was secured there and what qualified him. What qualified him? Virgin birth qualifies him. He, without the virgin birth, he cannot go to the cross because he, he too, like all men, would have been under Adamic sin. But when you read Luke 1, 31 through 35, you have the supernatural uh, work of the Holy Spirit in the life of... Uh, or, or with the, the uh, female uh, seed of Mary. And we call that virgin birth or conception in theology. So he's got to be born correctly. Then he's got to live and die correctly. And we call it impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We call it impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for me, for us. And we call that impeccable. You know, what's amazing to me is that he lived 33 years without sin, yet tempted like us in all ways. The writer of Hebrews talks about that in 7, 8, 9. Tempted like, like we were, yet without sin. It wasn't that he wasn't without temptation. He was without sin, and that's volitional. It's volitional. That's the bottom line anyhow in our life is volition, what we choose. And I find that. And then, of course, in between these two, uh, birth and death, is the hypostatic man, undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique man of the universe, the Son of God that came out of glory. He came to earth. 
and went back to glory to re, be reconfirmed in the glory of God. The presence. You know, Jesus made such a big deal out of presence with God. He talks about the presence with God before the world was began. He talks about the presence of God with him, with him in his earthly life. And then on the cross, he talks about the absence of the presence of God. And I think sometimes we don't realize what a gigantic idea that was in the life of, of Jesus Christ. Then he's raised from the dead, and we're back. He's now back into the discussion of the presence, back into the presence of God. Um, you know, in Psalms 22, 1, it was prophesied that he would speak these words from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we saw him quote those words from the cross as, as he is about to enter into the suffering for the sins of mankind. <clears throat> well, <coughs> then he goes back in his seat at the right hand of God the Father and everything that he is, we become. That's called positional truth. He's a son. We're a son. He's eternal life. We're eternal life. He's a priest. We're a priest. He's an heir. We're an heir. Inheritance, inheritance, and the list just goes on. I can't tell you how important that list is to your life. That list we call the 20 status privileges in the 50 things you receive in salvation. That, those 20 status privileges, you should pay attention to that every day of your life. Because the devil always telling you what a slug you are. You're ne never able to measure up. And, and it's all a lie. When, when you begin to question who you are or what you're about, you should go to this 20 status privilege because that's who you are and that's what you're all about. <clears throat> Don't, do, don't take two days to, to do that. <clears throat> In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. So we've gone from the body to the blood. We've got his qualifications to go to the cross, and the blood says this is a qualification for him to suffer for our sins. He's going he's gonna to be there um, six hours and the last three, darkness is covered as the earth, and this is going to be it's going to be bad. And when he talks about this cup is the new covenant in my blood, listen, when he goes to the cross, before he goes to the cross, he salutes the old covenant cup of shadow Christology. On the cross, he becomes the cup of the new covenant. And when he comes off the cup, we drink that cup. That's our cup. We take part in the cup. It's the cup of the new covenant. It's the cup of the new covenant. You don't get there because you go to church. You don't get there because you pick up this cup. You get there because you believe that the body that went to the cross and died for your sins, not for his, died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, is where you get the privilege to put your feet under the table, so to speak, and drink the new covenant cup. It, it's quite a privilege. It's quite a privilege. He said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so what you're dealing with is dealing with all the different passages in the Bible that deal with the blood of Christ. Redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, justification, sanctification. You're talking about forgiveness of sin, victory in the angelic conflict, a peace with God. You're talking about these things that have been given to you by grace. Because Jesus did the work and paid the price, we get it by grace. It's not that it's free. He paid the price that we could never pay. <laughs> For as often you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. <coughs> Therefore, 
Whoever eats the bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself. Why should he examine himself? Because we must not take part unworthily. What would that be? With sin in our life. Mental attitude sins, sense of the tongue, overt sins. You know, one of the sins that people sweep under the carpet is the sin of rebellion. They say, you know, I haven't gone out and committed any, any quote, sins. You know, in their mind, there are big sins and little ones, and they haven't done any of the big ones. But they're rebellious. They're rebellious against God. They're, re they're rebellious. They're just rebellious in their spirit. <clears throat> That's a sin. That's a sin. And it will get you in so much trouble. <clears throat> you need to confess that. Mental attitude, sin, sins, tongue, and sins. And it's up to you. Notice, let a, let a man examine himself. You have to do your own inspection. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, when you say, show me, he will show you. And when he does, then you in silence confess it. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. <laughs> That's not the only passage in the Bible that talks about that. But it's an important one, and it's one that you can remember. That's why we use it. So, he who eats, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he judges him, if he uh, drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. In other words, discipline will come. For this reason, many among you have become weak, sick, a number have died or, 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 or sleep. It's a euphemism for a believer dying. <laughs> if we judge ourselves rightly, that would be 1 John 1, 9 among many passages, but that would be a good one. If we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. It shows that you're a child of God. This Father loves you. He wants you to be back into a fellowship with him. He wants you to have a... Listen. The greatest discovery I made in my life as a young person was I wasn't just dumped off here on the earth. Now, that's kind of the way I viewed my life as a young person. When I was 15, I just kind of figured I was dumped off on the earth, you know, like babies left on a front door of someplace. And I really struggled at the age of 15 with some kind of identity that I had lost as, as, a, as a person. And listen, I struggled with that until I found Christ. When I found Christ, I found out why I was here, that I hadn't been just dumped off. I hadn't been just left on the doorstep of the world. And that was an amazing find for me. Now, maybe you have a whole lot more self-confidence than I did from a family background. But I'm telling you, that was quite a discovery. I was 21 years old when, when I discovered that. And that was quite a find for me. And I found my whole new identity in Jesus Christ. And... for whatever that's worth for you. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. By that, I'm, I'm saying to you that you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day to give you life everlasting. And you've made that personal decision in your life. I mean, we're, I'm assuming that but I'm not assuming that you don't understand, so I'm going to explain it to you. 
And once you believe that, you, you're privileged to take part in the Eucharist. But you can't take that part in this Eucharist just because it's passed to you. You've got to be sure that you're in the right fellowship with the Lord, that there's no unconfessed sin in your life. You take part in that, you'll be disciplined. So don't do that. You confess your sins. You take part in this. This is a privilege. It's a privilege to salute Jesus Christ who went to that cross and died in our place. It's a salute to God who raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God the Father on our behalf. So, Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Father, and pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this Eucharist today, February. This Eucharist carries us through February, the month of love. Great opportunities, Father, within our own family, our own marriage within the, the church, the body of Christ, <coughs> to express this great love that God has for us and has for them this month of February. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.